What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we have got on a professor from a professor of philosophy from Portland State University. He's also a public intellectual, and he is also the author of the book "How to Have Impossible Conversations." And this is, of course, Mr. Peter Bogosian. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure, man. We were just having a really good conversation before I'd actually started uh, <laughs> recording. So I'm going to dive straight into it. So we were just talking about uh, this situation. You know, we've been talking about battling weird ideas in the public space. And um, in the music world, not so long ago, there was a festival in Detroit where they were charging double price tickets to people who are white versus people who are so-called people of color. I don't like that term, but basically meaning non-white. And this is something that um, there was an artist named Tiny Jag who actually spoke to on my podcast recently, who pulled out of the festival. I tweeted about it. The thing went viral and it became a pretty big news story. So we were just on the cusp of discussing some of these weird ideas. And you were actually explaining to me uh, something called the progressive stack. So yeah. tell us a little bit more so about that. So that I that ticket idea came from somewhere. It comes from this thing called a progressive stack, and a progressive stack uh, originally came from Occupy Wall Street, in which certain marginalized people they privilege their voices when asking questions and in the conversation, and it even manifested itself in concerts. So when people went to a concert, those who had the most oppression variables got to go to the front, and those who had the least stayed in the back. So if you're a black lesbian I'm trying to think of some other oppression variable none hits me at the moment but Disab disabled uh well i so i didn't want to say disabled because you okay, should probably okay. go to the front anyway if you're disabled because you can't true, see true. and you know you have if there's a fire etc but um <clears throat> depending on the disability but so those people would go to the front and white cis hetero men would go to the back and it was a way to so this is a very important idea it's a way to what what they're really doing is they're they're trying to mitigate or address prior injustices and the word for that is equity and this is this is actually a super good uh way to think about it so they don't want equality which you treated like me you know the martin luther king's dream the judge of man etc cetera, et cetera. they're not looking for equal treatment for people they're looking for equity and equity is when we remediate the, the what's happened in the past to people, past historical injustices. So yeah. we actually wrote a fake paper, you know, for the grievance studies thing. That I did see that. <laughs> yeah, white cis hetero men should be put on the floor in chains. Um, <laughs> In the classroom is a form of experiential reparations, and the student, the teachers shouldn't answer their emails, etc. And so they should take a, they should take a privilege test when they go in. Uh, was so, that yeah. one of the ones that got published? No, that was that that was a uh, uh, resubmit. That was to the number one journal in the world, Hypatia. We already hoaxed them with another piece, um, but anyway. But that idea, we tried to put it in the official canon of literature, progressive stack. So then when people do despicable and racist things, they say, well, why are you doing this? They can point to our paper. <laughs> they can point to the literature and say, well, this, this is a pedagogical technique. Pedagogy is just, you know, like a teaching technique. This is a, a tool for classroom facilitation to facilitate, you know, students' education, et cetera. But yeah, so that idea comes from a progressive stack. Yeah. So essentially seeking some kind of equality of outcome rather than, of opportunity and also going back into the past and even for, to people, I guess, people who are from any kind of groups or tribes or communities where even if they themselves were never oppressed or discriminated against or whatever, the fact that that has happened to that group of people at some point in the past, um, although I guess you could easily argue that <laughs> every, every single every single person who exists at some point in history in some location. Yeah. That group of people has been, a, but I'm obviously using critical thinking, and I think the people right. who and the, dive into this stuff don't. Well, you you put your finger on one problem with it. I would say it's a secondary problem, but you know what's the calculus to figure that out? So my heritage is Armenian, and my parents were, my grandparents were in a genocide. My grandfather's brothers were murdered, et cetera. <coughs> 
So mm-hmm. how am I, how does that enter into the calculus for, so, I mean, that's certainly a problem, but the idea that we should treat people differently on the basis of their immutable characteristic is just a, it's not even a slap in the face to the enlightenment. It, it's just a total repudiation of all the, the values that, that build civilized societies. It is. And it's, it's really weird how a lot of people don't see this. Like that, that's the thing I find, I find weirdest. So, yeah. you know, discussing that whole ticket pricing thing, for example. Right. Um, I mean, the artist who pulled out of it, Tiny Jag, I mean, she, she's been on the receiving end of a lot of hate, a lot of abuse, a lot of criticism from people who are saying that she's uh, pandering to white supremacists or she's caping for the enemy and all the, all these kind of terms, you know, lots of racial Coconut. slurs. Yeah. Lots of racial slurs being thrown at her and all that. And as someone who myself has been on the receiving end of that in the past because of a couple of tweets that I've made and, you know, views that I have and whatever, I wasn't, I think she was a lot more, I, she'd never experienced that before as I was talking to her about it. So I think she was totally, totally caught off guard, like, whoa, what the heck is, what's going on here? Um, and it's really, really weird how, um, I mean, first of all, that the festival organizers thought that was a good idea <laughs> and nobody thought, hmm, maybe maybe we shouldn't do that. And then the fact that people are defending it or saying, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good idea. And, you know, it seems like people are looking for, I think, what did I say the other day? You know, it's like people are looking for revenge rather than equality. And again, revenge, not even for something that necessarily has impacted, you know, has impacted them directly. It's just like, oh, well, people were racist or sexist or mean to us in the past. So let's just flip the tables and do the same to them. And I really don't like that mentality. Yeah. And, and so you think that's the crazy thing about it. The thing that I think is the crazy thing about it, and I agree with you, but the thing that's like extra crazy to me is that the argument that not treating someone the same, in other words, treating people differently on the basis of their race or their sexuality or something they can't control, mm. even if they could control it, makes you a conservative. Like, that's the super crazy part. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't make you a conservative. It actually makes you a liberal. Mm. Right? And so we, we've, we've have this, we're in this really weird space where there's an inversion of terms. And everybody's throwing around these terms. They're chucking around Nazi and fascist. And everybody's a Nazi. And, you know, who is it? I just saw a tweet this morning about, you know, some guy said, you know, most Democrats are Nazis. I mean, now the, the semantic range of Nazis, everyone's a freaking Nazi. We're going to punch yeah, yeah. people, milkshake these people, punching everybody. I mean, it's just, it's, the society cannot function like this. No, I mean, I'm a young, I'm a young black British man, and I've been called a Nazi multiple times. Um, <laughs> no, 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 normally by white guys, which is why it's extra fun. <laughs> You know, like there'll be some, some, you know, hyper woke, hyper woke, progressive white guy on Twitter who somehow has the audacity to call a black guy a Nazi and, and they don't see any irony or hypocrisy. What Nazis would do to you if they caught you, right? <laughs> That's the thing. I'm just like, it, it, it's so absurd that it doesn't all. Right. Um, it almost doesn't make me angry because it's yeah. so it's so yeah. ridiculous. Like yeah. it doesn't even. Yeah. And it's and it's ignorant. And, w- w- you know, I mean, I'm not a big fan of being offended. In, th- in fact, I think it's pretty ridiculous to be offended. Th- there is something about. I don't I don't you know that th- there would be songs and uh, like, you know, mit Juden blood with the stabbing. But anyway, uh, you know, when they, when they would call Jews Nazis, I think that's like the peak of the end. That's when you know the whole thing is, I'd say jump the shark, but that's not treating it seriously enough. That's when the whole kind of mental disorder is really revealed. That you have to, that you go around, you know, Ben Shapiro, yarmulke wearing Jew, practicing Orthodox <laughs> Jew as a Nazi. Like, yeah. that's so, that's so repugnant in so many ways that, a slur. I mean, that's really what it is. It's a slur. So we don't yeah. agree with somebody. <laughs> we want to find someone who thinks that people should be treated equally or not treated differently on the basis of race. Nazi. <laughs> it's, 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 it's so strange. Sometimes I'm just like, what is, you know, what is going on here? It's the weirdest thing. I mean, how can you call a Jewish person a Nazi? How can you call a black person a white supremacist and not 
even pause for one second in your brain and go, wait, hang on, <laughs> you know, like, like does this does this make sense? And I think I think one of the big problems with that as well is it dilutes the terms completely. Totally, you know, it completely dilutes these terms because, you know, it's weird and it's 2019 and suddenly more than ever, more than ever in my lifetime. I'm seeing words like Nazi and white supremacist and white supremacy. I'm I'm seeing these terms and fascist fascist. I'm seeing these terms being used more often than ever at any other previous time in my life, despite these things being at an all time low. Like there are not very many true white supremacists out there. And, you know, I'm a black guy. Like if if the KKK is actually on the right, <laughs> right? If, if if this if these things are coming, it's like I'd actually would want to know, you know right. what I mean? But yeah. now if you're just gonna call everybody who is a centrist or a classical liberal or a conservative or whatever, if you're just gonna call all these people all these names, then if someone is a genuine if someone is a genuine threat, it's like you don't even now have a word yeah, that there's defines these people like if there is a real neo-nazi you know like a genuine neo-nazi group or something and someone's like oh yeah they're nazis it's like okay do you do you mean do you mean actual nazi or do you mean you, you see what i mean it's, it's like right I, I don't even know what these terms mean now i'm just like they're kind of shrugging my shoulders like you know if, even the term racist if someone is like oh that guy's a racist like there was a time in my life where i would take that seriously right and now it's at a stage well, where i'm just should, like right yeah, it's, yeah. It's and, like, and you're taking that seriously means that that word has weight. Mm -hmm. And now when that's tossed around, I do think that the important thing to remember is that the problem is that we have a perception that the total number of people calling everybody a Nazi, et cetera, is like, you know, 25 percent of the population. I don't think it's anywhere close to that. But what I do think is that these people are hyper vocal and they're on social media constantly and then they operate in these ecosystems they follow you they follow me they follow people in our space and we or I'll just put it on myself have an inflated idea of how many crackpots there are out there I don't think that these people are even remotely close to the majority I think oh, no. that they're the hyper hyper vocal fringe minority that literally are under accomplished have no life must sit in their basement constantly and tweet that everybody's a nazi but, uh, but some of them are very prominent and quite influential people you know you have got journal you have got certain journalists and media outlets and television pundits journalists and, guardian yeah <laughs> i think and i'm not going to name some but people on yeah. the guardian who are antifa supporters and andy uh -huh. no the guy who was assaulted in portland in late may J june or late June, uh, he's written about that extensively, how Antifa has infiltrated, you know, like certain things. Uh, you know, it's the typical suspects you'd, you'd suspect and their sympathizers, Salon and Slate, who published hit pieces on me, didn't let me respond to those. And The Guardian is, is of course, chief among those. And so they've really wormed their way into the journalistic infrastructure. Mm. And, it's, and it's a shame because, you know, I know to take these things with a huge grain of salt. You know to take these things with a huge grain of salt. But a lot of the people who are in the middle, who are much more moderate, who aren't doing the name calling, they still do see some of those articles and they do see these things and they think, hmm. Well, yeah. You know, a, a great example uh, on, a, on a, like a very widespread one would be, uh, for example, like uh, all the hit pieces that came out about uh, Jordan Peterson. Right. Especially in the sort of past two years, right? right? So you'd have people who, you know, aren't familiar with him, have never heard of him, whatever. The first thing they're seeing about this Jordan Peterson, you know, oh, controversial Canadian professor. He's been known to, you know, be some... monogamy is what they say, right? Exactly. You know, he's, he's got lots of alt-right alt followers and alt -right, he, appe right. he appeals, to, appeals to angry white men. Right. And, you know, and you even see in the interviews, they're always like, hmm, you seem to have a, a you know, a, a very you know, uh, a, a large following amongst, you know, angry white men. Are you tapping into the same vein that Trump, you know, they, they just ask these very loaded questions and you're just kind of sitting there. I'm just sitting there with my, my jaw drop, just kind of like, right. do you even know who you are talking right. to? But I mean, but any, I mean, anyone who's remotely in, I don't it's even know what Kathy to call Newman's this field, but it's the, it's the Kathy Newman interview rehashed in different variations. Mm hmm. But it's so weird. I mean, the amount of people who I know to some degree mm. and I'm familiar with their work, 
who have just been completely, uh, what's the word, slandered essentially yeah. <laughs> by by at least some of the media is crazy. It's almost like it's a rite of passage now. Like I don't that, think there's. <laughs> yeah, it is, and it's not just in social media, although that's where it's most conspicuous because we we see it. And I remember I put a tweet out saying, like, we really have to rein in the use of the word Nazi and make it so that there, we apply it to actual Nazis. Like, the, and I don't think there are any, maybe one, I don't think there are any living actual Nazis anymore. And people went freaking crazy. Like, <laughs> you know, and because you demean the term, and when you, like a racist, when you say, when you just toss it around, it doesn't mean anything. And, you know, my mentor was, uh, he he died at 97. He was in Buchenwald. He was in the Holocaust. And there's something incredibly demeaning about that mm -hmm. to those experience. You know, these people love to talk about lived experiences to the to the to that to Frank's lived experiences. Uh, but I did that, and the hate was just. But you know, I think that anytime you ask you, you like when what you what you've done, anytime you ask people to think a little deeper or question it, people love it when you go after someone else's beliefs. But when you go after their sacred cows, they can't stand it. You know, when I was yeah. heavily in the atheist movement, people used to, you know, love it when 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 I challenged basic tenets of Christian beliefs or what have you. Uh, but, you know, and the same people now, the grievance studies folks, they couldn't stand it when I went after their unsubstantiated beliefs. So I, I guess it comes down to what kind of life do you want to lead? You know, and I think you make your contribution in music, a contribution I could never make. I'm zero musical. And I try to make my contribution in, in other ways ways although the tools that we use are the same they're both lyrics and words yeah so um i want to get into your your new book in a second but um i've done something that i don't normally do with this podcast and that is i've jumped sort of straight into the meat of an issue without i feel you know really getting a good picture especially for the listeners i've right. read a, i know a little bit about your background but um you know doing a proper intro to who you are your work and what it is that's led you to where you are right now Oh, thanks. Well, I teach. I currently teach. I hope <laughs> I <don't know> what <laughs> at Portland State University. Uh, I'm in a little bit of trouble, so I don't know how long that's going to last. Uh, I just write and read, and I I teach ethics, and I I love questioning and challenging dominant moral orthodoxies in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I just said, I was involved in the atheist movement, but not from this point of view of like rah rah atheism. But from the point of view that I thought that many of the beliefs in God just were unsubstantiated and I wanted people to think more deeply and reflect about that. And then I used so, – so, OK, so let me take a step back. The thing that is most interesting to me is when people think a problem can't be solved. That is when I shine. That is when I – so I my initial work was done in the prisons with prison inmates and – I developed a literally a no cost program based upon uh, ancient writings like Plato and Aristotle um, to help prison inmates desist from criminal behavior. People said it couldn't be done, so I like that. And then uh, <coughs> to uh, faith and faith based beliefs, I developed mm -hmm. a no cost intervention to talk to people uh, who who held faith based beliefs. I developed an app called Atheos, in which which is free to download. People can, you know, it's like if someone says this, you can, in a respectful, civil way, no punching, no milkshakes, none of that stuff, you can have a conversation with them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have to say that. It's totally ridiculous, right? I don't think the, the Christian community, as far as I'm aware, is uh, we, don't, we don't throw milkshakes around. No, I know. And, and that's, <laughs> that's the, the thing. It's, it's you know, the... the First Peter three fifteen give a reason for the defense of your faith, and it's probably that one passage alone that's created a vibrant intellectual resilience among people who hold those beliefs. Okay, so anyway, and then so then I did the grievance study thing. I saw a with James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose. We found a tremendous problem in academia with people believing stuff that's just total totally untethered to reality. And we published a bunch of bogus papers. I think we got seven in. Uh, and published before the Wall Street Journal busted us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you. I know you've spoken about this multiple times before. But for for listeners who are brand new to you, can you uh, just share a couple of the topics that you touched on? Oh well, uh, for these folks, everything is a problem. Everything <laughs> is a problem. They've problematized everything. 
And so we claim that uh, there's a woman named Helen, Helen Wilson we fabricated that she sat in a Portland dog park. This is the most the paper that got us busted, actually. <laughs> she, it was just so crazy. It was so over the top. So the, the journalists saw what the reviewers didn't see and the editors um, that she examined the genitals of thousands of dogs and then interrogated their owners about their sexual orientation and then concluded that it's, it's unfortunate that we can't leash men like dogs because dog dog parks are petri dishes for canine rape culture and it went on and and then we claimed i have to watch my language and some of the stuff is very unfamily family friendly so i have to <laughs> slow down but you know we claim that there should be a category in bodybuilding called fat bodybuilding where fat <laughs> people go in and display their fat and they're in a non-competitive way and they're given equal time and they can wear fashion have the clothes of their choice and they just you know show their layers of you, you can't use the word obesity because they don't like that word they call it a medicalized narrative and then we wrote a paper about i heard the other day that the term obesity is violent and anti-black that's the one i heard last week i can understand how it's this might shock you that i can actually <laughs> but i'm literally a world class <laughs> caller in the field right now uh i can <laughs> i can understand that was actually the easiest thing of everything that we learned in this is is uh, fat studies i think i was able to read virtually all of the literature in fat studies in under a month and the project okay. lasted I, I i wasn't aware there was literature on i didn't wasn't aware that fat studies was a discipline nor that there was literature on it yeah, it, it basically, it's it's kind of, uh, oh, as a Christian, you can relate to this. It's kind of like an apology, like an apologetics for being fat. Okay. And so it's not about, you know, A1Cs or diet or, you know, how many cupcakes should a normal person eat or macronutrients. It's about a defense of fatness mm -hmm. and making a robust uh, – and, and it's in a journal, so people can actually point to it and 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 uh, and pretend it's knowledge. So uh, yeah, and so the the big takeaway there for me is that they don't like the term obesity because they call it a narrative. Everything is a narrative to these folks. Everything is a social construct. Uh, so A one sees that's a social construct. You want to think that's a social? You can think that's a social construct all you want, but I think it's like seven zero. Your A one sees. I know mine are five. Five, uh, five, four right now. Six, I think five, six to six something is pre-diabetic. Those numbers are not going to lie. But anyway, we submitted a bunch of papers. Uh, again, I have to be careful because of my language. Because some of these, but putting <laughs> putting certain objects in, in certain places, <laughs> uh, and we argued that if they did, that they'd be less transphobic. And oh and, yeah, I heard about yeah. this one. And then we argued that. Um, Feminist men were far more likely to do this, men who self-identified as feminists. That was a little thank you to all the people who have been harassing me <laughs> mercilessly over the years. <laughs> it's, pr it's probably true. Yeah, well, then it's the other thing, true. yeah. That, well, for them, I'm sure it is. And then the other thing that, we, that I did is all the people who have also been harassing me, I made sure that I cited all their papers. <laughs> <laughs> that was my other thank you to them. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> it is brilliant. So, I mean, what what spurred you to do that? I mean, how did how did you guys? I mean, yourself, James, and Helen. How did you? Uh, how did this even come about? I I I couldn't take it anymore. I I I couldn't take the the nonsense anymore. I I couldn't take the fact that people. I was just so deeply concerned about my students and what they were learning and and. I do believe that the American universities are um, the gems of our American exceptionalism. I do believe that that's one of the cores. And I saw an erosion of confidence in the universities, particularly among conservatives. And I'm not even a conservative. I know everybody calls me a Nazi and a conservative and a fascist, but I'm actually none of those things. I took the world's smallest political quiz, by the way. Just just to say, those those th those three things are all pretty different, just for anyone. Yes, listening. they are. Well, not to these. <laughs> I, know, I know people conflate them, but they're, they're, they're interchangeable they're synonyms. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but but I saw what was happening and I, and I saw, I mean, the fact studies thing, the reason that we targeted that, we targeted the number one journal, I think, so we targeted, that we had a, a way of of uh, identifying problem, well, identifying the journals that were purveying this 
this dangerous nonsense. And we wanted to raise awareness among people like yourself and others that there were actually disciplines named fat studies. And they don't do what people think that they do. And so I saw this stuff happening. I saw speech being restricted. I saw people feeling uncomfortable giving their opinions. I noticed in my ethics classes, I was brought up on charges for saying things or there are certain subjects I couldn't discuss. I couldn't discuss anything, uh, couldn't render my opinion about a protected class. Um, of course, my response to that was, so what am I, what do I do if, if I'm asked my opinion about what I think, uh, about whether or not it's ethical to keep black people in chains. Can't render my opinion about it because it's a protected class. Blacks. So, so no, no opinion whatsoever. I cannot render my opinion. What's your opinion about slavery? I can render my opinion about like, so this is very interesting. If it's not a protected class, and I still am not clear what a protected class is, but if it's not a protected class, like um, I don't eat factory farm meat. I think it's uh, morally wrong. It's another conversation, but uh, I'm allowed to talk about factory farming. I'm allowed to render my opinion about, even though I'm totally unqualified to do so, uh, anthropogenic global warming because it's not a protected class. But I'm not allowed to render my opinion about a trans issue, about uh, you know black issue, about gay issue, because those things are protected classes. So, sure, I mean, surely that, and how long, how long has that been the case? Was that enforced by the university specifically? That's a very difficult question to answer because Obama put in these things called Title IX violations in which universities and diversity officers went completely wild with this stuff. It's hard to say. I started noticing it, and Jonathan Haidt also places the date around about five years ago. Okay. Uh, four years ago, it was really in full force. But, but okay, I'm, that really wasn't my problem that people had unsubstantiated beliefs. Everybody has unsubstantiated beliefs. I'm sure I have unsubstantiated beliefs. So that really wasn't the thing that pushed me over the edge. The thing that pushed me over the edge was every time I would ask somebody, one of my colleagues or someone in the administration, well, what is your evidence for this? I mean, in an, ac in, in an academic setting, you, of course, not only should you be allowed to ask that, it's incumbent upon you to ask that. You're teaching this to people, microaggressions, trigger warning, safe space, what's your evidence for that? I want to see some evidence. And time after time after time, the overwhelming majority of people didn't, not only did they not have evidence for that, but now this is when it becomes interesting. It, it, it was as if I wasn't asking in the Theotetus, Plato's, Plato says, or Socrates says, people believe something, they only believe something because they don't have all the information. And if they only had all the information, they wouldn't believe what, what, they, what they believe. And so mm -hmm. when I would ask people this stuff, I'm trying to get my brightness right, when I would ask people this stuff, it was not as if I l lacked a piece of information, which is an epistemological problem, like a problem of knowledge of how we know of what you know, but it was a moral problem. So I was a bad person for asking this. Mm -hmm. And we created these spaces in the academy, the worst place to do this, because these kids are going to spill out. Peterson talks about that as well. And then they go into the workforce, they become leaders, et cetera, and they bring these crazy ideas with them. So we've created a almost perfect conditions to not solve any of our problems. And in the meantime, more and more issues that we had to ha that we have to have difficult conversations about weren't being talked about. So it was a it was a strange combination. At the same time, everybody kept filing, you know, charges against me for in my you know, I don't teach accounting, I teach ethics. So talking about this stuff in my ethics classes. Uh, and the the funniest, the most interesting thing about this is, is I really ascribe to the dominant moral orthodoxy myself. So it's yeah. not like I'm some renegade conservative or, you know, uh, I believe this stuff myself. But I believe that people need to, as John Stuart Mill's one of his dictums, I believe that they need to be challenged and questioned on what they believe. That's absolutely. That's the role of an education. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's something I really like. That's uh, that's one of the my favorite things about doing this podcast is just speaking to such a broad range of guests from different perspectives, parts of the world, political views, believers, non-believers, different religions. Like, I love that. Um, I mean, I was telling you before we started the show, you know, I grew up in Saudi Arabia and I went to an international school. And so from a really, really young age, I was surrounded by, you know, it was like a true diversity, like diversity in the proper sense of the world of the words, just all 
kinds of diversity, you know, being in a Muslim country with Arab students, American students, Canadian, British, South American, Chinese, just Indian, Sri Lankan, people literally from, from everywhere. And so from a really young age, that's always just been the, the, the norm for me, right? And I, I've got friends of all okay. different... Okay, so can I, okay, go for it. May I pause you there and say something? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so you're harboring the same perception that people who don't swim in this pond harbor, which is a totally normal, which is actually intentional on their part. So when you say diversity, <clears throat> you mean it like everybody on everybody needs it. But when they yeah. say diversity, that's not what they mean. Mm -hmm. They mean ideological homogeneity. They mean diversity in the most shallow kind of a way. Mm -hmm. Skin diversity, sexual orientation, that kind of diversity. Diversity that really like nobody really cares about that much. But what they've done is they've systematically culled diverse voices from the academy. And by diverse and I'm not a Christian, right? They've called Christian voices out of the academy, and I think that's wrong. They have called libertarian voices, and I'm not a libertarian, and I think that's wrong. I think these kids need to be taught by people who actually believe this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a problem. So when you, you use the term, it's kind of like when these people use the term Nazi, which you've been talking about. When you <laughs> use the term, you, you use it like everybody means it. And so when you someone says, well, well, what, what, Zubi, well what's the problem with you? Why aren't you for diversity? The, the, but you are for diversity. You're for intellectual diversity as well. But that's when they use, good. yeah, exactly. But when they use the term, that's not what they mean. And I, I want to say one more thing too about that. So there's this woman named Megan Bowler. She's uh, uh, she has this thing called the pedagogy of discomfort, and I agree with a good chunk of this. And the idea basically is that part of the role of education is that at some level people have to be become uncomfortable with what they believe. Now, she situates this strictly in terms of a racial, primarily racial, but a gender context as well. But there is a profound truth, and if you read Plato's works, you see this perhaps most conspicuously, in when you challenge your beliefs, there's really something in that process that causes you to be an adult, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it, and if it's done right, it will force you to, it's probably the only time in your life in the academy where you have a genuine opportunity to hear a diverse, or you should have a genuine opportunity to have your beliefs challenged in a classroom setting that, you know, we use this overuse it or wrong, you know, safe space. No one's going to punch you. No one's going to throw a milkshake at you. We are rapidly losing that if we've not already lost that. Yeah. I think this, the sad thing is a lot of these words and terms have been hijacked. Mm. So, and I, I think in a way, I mean, I think some of it is, some of it might be accidental, but I feel like some of it is actually quite a clever strategic move from the people who are say, you know, the hyper progressive far left type of thinkers, yeah. which is that they've taken words, which people, you know, on a surface level, certainly agree with diversity, fairness, inclusion, right. um, safety. Right. They, they've taken these words and they've kind of bastardized them. So, yeah, they've you know, changed the meanings of ordinary words. Equity is the best example. But everything yeah. you said, safety, it, it's all it's 100 percent correct. Yeah, because then if you stand against their ideas, they go, oh, well, you're anti diversity. Oh, you're anti fairness. Oh, you're anti. And it's like, no, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like it's like, no, absolutely not. Right. But uh, right. We're and, not and, speaking the same language here. 100 percent. And that you're exactly right. And. That's a technique from the book. And you're exactly right. And what they have done as a result of that is it's not just that you don't know something. It's that you're a bad person. Yep. Right. Always. You're a bad person because you don't have this particular worldview. And and the consequence of that, or there are many consequences of that, but one consequence of that is students don't have that dialogue model for them. So, mm -hmm. you know, I did a, an event with uh, Brett and Heather and Christine Hoff Summers, and there was a tenured professor you can see this, this is on YouTube. She starts screaming at me in the middle of the event. This is at Portland State University. And so not only do students not have model for them how to have impossible conversations or difficult conversations, they have an anti-model for them, right? So they see their, what they consider to be role models, their professors screaming at other professors, screaming, and not even screaming anything sensical either. Um, and the consequence of that is that we have lost that ability to have a conversation because it's not modeled for us. Yeah, that's a shame. I mean, that, there's just a lot of 
I guess what I call emotional incontinence <laughs> that's that's out there where you know like maybe I'm maybe I'm unique in this regard but I know with myself from an intellectual perspective one I'm just interested in why people believe different yeah. things you know just 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 generally so I know what I believe I know what I don't believe but with any position that I hold or anything even I don't have a strong position on I want to know the best argument on every side. So yes, I so I was raised a Christian. I've always believed in God, but I think it's very important for me, and it leads to really interesting and enlightening conversations for me to, you know, if if I'm talking to, if I'm talking about does God is does God exist or not, right? I want to have that conversation with the uh, with a very smart, you know, very very smart right. atheist who has really thought it through. I don't want to, I don't want I don't want the dumbest version of the argument. Right. right. I don't just want, oh, you believe in God, LOL, you're dumb. Right. It's like, dude, that's not you, you know I mean, I'm just like, well, that, this is we, right. we can't really go anywhere from here. So you know, so want... that's that's an intellectual virtue. And that virtue, I would argue, will carry you very far in, in life. And I would also argue that how do we teach people to hold that value? Like that's a value that needs to be institutionalized. And often I find in the academy in particular, what these folks will do is in any, almost anything with the word studies in it, it's been contaminated. They'll find, I don't know if the word stupid is right, but they'll find the dumbest conservative, right? They'll find, and they'll usually find someone who's aesthetically, and they'll show those arguments as if, aha, instead yeah. of taking a look at the best arguments uh, and really to version of something else that's in how to have impossible conversation, rap reports, rules, like you wanna take what someone says to you and re-articulate it to them in such a way that they say, wow, I wish I had thought of that. But we don't, we pick on the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's trying to score points. And I think it's also because people tie up their identity so much in their beliefs. Totally. So totally. with me, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, I know, again, I, I know people of all persuasions, but I mean, I, I know even some fellow Christians that I know, right? I mean, even if I'm having a discussion with them, they can, you know, I mean, everyone does this, you know, I've, I've had atheists do it, Christians do it, Muslims do it. It's, it's like their identity is tied in too much to the belief or the lack of belief. So if somebody criticizes or questions God or Christianity or religion in general, I don't take, the, I don't, I don't personally perceive that as an attack on myself, as Zubi, as an individual, right. I'm not like, okay, this person is attacking me they're demonizing me i'm like no i can separate the idea or the belief from me and it seems like a lot of people can't do that whether that's religiously politically whatever whatever the case may be it's like if you criticize their some part of the belief system they, they just perceive it as an attack on them or maybe on a, a whole wider group or whatever i mean we saw this with um we were talking before we were rolling about my viral deadlift tweet right okay right. which i think the intention of the, the intention and the thing I was pointing out, I think, is fairly simple to understand, right? There's biological differences between men and women in terms of physical strength. And due to that, you might want these people who are trying to push to have, you know, biological men competing against women in sport, you might you might want to reconsider for very factual reasons, right? It was done in a humorous point. But it's like some people intentionally or unintentionally, they they couldn't take that as anything but some kind of attack on people right. and i was like I, di I didn't at i didn't attack anything i i didn't even really say it i didn't even say anything about trans people really right right that, that was it's like that wasn't even the thing so, right or some people thought it was an attack on women some people right. thought i was trying to show that women are inferior to men and that and it, it's really really strange i think people are just too tied up in it yeah that inference comes from their reality tunnel, but the literature on belief and belief revision is one of my specialties, uh, shows that if, and, and the, the literature of religious psychology as well, which, which James Lindsay knows very well, it shows that the moment something becomes an identity concern, it's much more difficult to revise the belief. Mm -hmm. So once someone views something as someone's identity, <coughs> they view uh, questioning or challenging or a probing of that idea or, or of that um, um, characteristic, a personal attack. And then it becomes almost impossible to revise at that point. Moral yeah, beliefs yeah. are the same way. That's, those are the things that keep people believing. Daniel Dennett, 
the, the philosopher from Tufts calls it belief and belief. In other words, people believe that they should believe in something, and then it's very difficult to dislodge that belief. Gotcha. gotcha. So I think this is a really good segue into your book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. So we've kind of been talk talking about this for the past 40 minutes, but um, I want to get into some practical tips. So I've had a look through, I haven't had a chance yet to read the entire book, but I've read through the seven fundamentals that okay. it begins with. So for the people who are listening to this, maybe they're students, maybe they're in their workplace, maybe they're just, you know, curious citizens and they're struggling to have some of these conversations. What sort of practical advice or tips can you offer to them? That's great. So that's a, a great question because everybody at some point is going to need to be or they'll find themselves in a situation that they feel, oh, my gosh, this is an impossible conversation. What am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? And so the book builds up. It's just, just there are eight chapters and they're in progressive difficulty, fundamentals, basics, intermediate, advanced, expert and master. And so the lat latter chapters teach you how to have a conversation with a an ideologue, a religious hard, hardliner, um, some kind of a, a zealot or a dogmatist. And the earlier chapters just give you the tools to su survive a family dinner. Um, so among the things in the, the first chapter, one of the things you do is you have to ask yourself, what's your goal, right? So what's your goal in a conversation? You figure out what your goal is, and then you can act accordingly. Maybe your goal is to just survive. Maybe your goal is to quote unquote win. Maybe your goal is to understand. So we talked about we, we discussed different goals that you should have. So you should clarify that when you go into the conversation and you can keep in mind, maybe I want to change that. Maybe I've engaged this or maybe I've engaged the person and they're just not acting in, they're just not an honest broker of conversation, which is fine too. There's skill sets for that. All right. How are we doing so far? Cool. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So then among the other things in the first chapter is, and everybody thinks they, they do this, but very few people do this. There is a mountain of literature, particularly in sales that we went through about why listening is so important. And, uh, you really want to listen and understand exactly what somebody is saying to you. So what is the person saying to you? And you need to ask questions like you need to find out not only what are they saying to you, but to have specific targeted ways of saying that we break those down in the book exactly how you can ask a question that's not threatening, not using the word you, et cetera. Okay. How are we doing so far there? Cool. Yeah, that's all good. When you say not using the word you, can you yeah. uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So, uh, and then they do this in hostage. A lot of the book draws from hostage negotiation as well. So every time you say you, like you believe that invokes a defensive posture in somebody. And so you never, you, you would never want to do that unless it's in a rare exception, which we talk about in chapter seven, but you'd want to say, you'd want to switch it to, instead of talking about, well, you're wrong about that. Uh, you'd want to call a belief or a claim into question and divorce it from the person. So mm -hmm. there's no like you, or, you know, there's no named there's just like this idea. So you're separating, like you said, an identitarian concern, you're separating the person and their person's identity from the claim that they're making. And okay, the, okay. the words that you use are that important. And the literature is absolutely crystal clear on why that's important. So um, we, I think as we talked about that in chapter four, exactly what words you should use and uh, why you should use them. And, and, and also like words like we and us, you know, let's figure this out. Let us figure this out. We can do this. So, so it's a, a built-in kind of a team or a partnership where you're working on a problem together as opposed to attacking someone, someone's belief. Yeah. So a more cooperative approach right. rather than a competitive one. Yeah. And it's hard to do that. I mean, everybody has their Achilles heels. Uh, you know, I have my Achilles heels. I'm talking to certain people about certain beliefs. Um, but the key then is to separate the person from their belief and thinking about the person as a partner with whom you're trying to share these or solve these problems. It's difficult, but there, there are <clears throat> literally there are people don't like the word techniques, but they are, te they really are techniques. There are simple techniques that you can use in terms of the words that you use, the order of questions that you frame, how to build rapport with someone in the, in, in the initial dialogue. Uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, so this is just be honest with me. 
this is like our moment of uh, our moment of truth right now. How are you feeling Still about right. our our conversation right now? I'm feeling good. I'm I'm fully into it. Yeah, I'm fully into it too. I'm feeling good. And I think one of the things that made that possible is our initial banter in the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of it there is, you know, we're not going to engage. If I were to engage you on a, a, a substantive disagreement, think of how you would have felt if I did that within the first minute of our conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think this is I think this is one of the big problems of social media and especially Twitter. I because agree. because people just jump in. <laughs> people, people, there's there's no rapport building. There's no pleasantries. There's no greeting. People just jump in straight on some contentious issue with right. no context, no background about the person, nothing, and just go straight at it. And that's never going to lead to a productive and civil conversation. Yeah, that's right. And you, it's very easy to just have in the medium itself doesn't allow that, but it's very easy to just. So the, the key to that, the key to build rapport is you want to ask questions about things you genuinely want to know. Mm -hmm. And most people will love to talk about themselves and I love to find out about people. So that actually works well. So in those rapport building stages, you just don't jump right into initial a conversation. And Anthony Magna Bosco is fantastic for that. He's wonderful. YouTube channel where he goes and he talks to people who have different beliefs and you'll see in those the rapport building it doesn't take long at all but it's yeah, really yeah. important to that we know each other as humans as opposed to someone who holds this belief that I don't hold and then it, you other them They're, they become the other yeah it's very similar to sales well very yeah similar to sales just like you wouldn't you know accost somebody uh, I mean as a musician the way I initially built my fan base was I used to just travel around the UK with a backpack full of CDs and go out on the high street and stop people on the street and talk to them. And I used to just sell my CDs to stranger old, strangers all day. And yeah, I mean, I'd see other people attempting to do it and no rapport building, right? They just exactly. jump in, yo, yo, man, you like buy my CD kind of thing. Right. And obviously people are like, no, go away. Right. However, you know, if you spend that one to two, 30, 30 seconds to two minutes, get to know the person a little bit, find out what they're up to that day, you know, just a little bit of chit chat. And then you can see again to, Hey, look, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. Um, you know, check this out, give this a listen. And yeah, lo and behold, people, people are far more receptive. Touch, right. Yeah. And, and that's why that that's in the fun, the fundamental section or the beginning section. It's a super, super easy, uh, very, very basic technique, but yet a lot of people don't do it. And it really, really kind of is a technique. You're just asking people about themselves and you're real, but things you want to know, you know, mm -hmm. you're asking people, so you're taking advantage of, you're not manufacturing anything. You have a natural curiosity and, you know, and the Aristotle says, you know, all, all men want to know. I, I, th I think that's true. Something like that. But the basic idea is you're just asking people questions you want to know anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So have we covered, so I'm trying to think if we've covered all the fundamentals. So you got rapport, listening. I don't um, I think there are seven I, of them, but uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. They're all, they all melt together. Oh, that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that um, the most effective way to have a conversation with someone is to never use one strategy or technique. It's to build, build them on top of each other. So in the later, the later chapters, we talk about scales, which is like the best technique that it's, just, I love, I love it. I love it. I've been using it for years. Best technique I've ever come up with. But it's basically, uh, it's not in the fundamental section, but it's basically asking someone to put their confidence in their belief on a scale. Okay, and so okay. you say, well, how confident are you in that in one to 10? Now they don't have to use a scale. They can make a one to 100. They can make whatever you want. But what it does is, this is a huge conversation. But one, one of the things it does is it will enable you to assess at the end of your conversation, it's like a pre-test and a post-test, if at all they moved as a result of that conversation and it, or if your belief moved up and down. And it will enable you to figure out how confident they are in their belief because higher levels of confidence would cause you to ask different questions. But even that isn't any good. You can't just at, walk up to someone and say, well, how confident are you that Jesus Christ walked on water, right? So you have to have the rapport building. You have to listen. You have to know what the claims are. All of these things act together in concert to make 
a conversation that people think is impossible possible because the overwhelming majority of conversations are possible we just don't know how and not only do we not know how we see it modeled for us like in the academy of exactly how not to do it yeah yeah so here's a here's a wider philosophical question is why in your opinion is it so important to have these conversations why why did you feel ne it necessary to write a book on how to have difficult conversations, especially given people are naturally uncomfortable with them. It's a great conversation. I think the book resulted in the age. We have an age in which we have to have these conversations. We're more interconnected now than we've ever been in the past. I see increased hostility. Sometimes I'm sad. My uh, I think about my mentor a lot. And I really I used to ask him a lot of questions about you know, having grown up in Nazi Germany, et cetera, but. It seems to me, and I'm 52, we're more polarized now than we ever were before. People are not talking to each other. And a lot of that is because they think that the person across from them is an existential threat. Helen Pluckrose has written about that. So it's not that they're just wrong, as we said, or they're missing a piece of information, but their very existence is a threat to your very existence. Um, they're not getting it in the academy. They don't know how to have conversations. So that's why they need to go on Rogan, right, to have those conversations. Or mm -hmm. That's why. I saw one of the reasons I think Rogan is so popular is because he will be blunt, he'll be forthright in his speech. People have a hunger for honest dialogue and they're certainly not getting in the university. I mean, yeah. not even close to it. So I wrote the book or we wrote the book because there's a need for it. People want to have those conversations or sometimes they don't, but they're trapped and they don't know what to do. And if we don't, if you don't have conversations is a Latin expression, <clears throat> then the only other alternative is war. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I always say. I always say there's there's three options. Uh, discussion, segregation and fighting. That's right. It doesn't, doesn't matter the relationship, whether it's on a personal individual scale or a nation scale. Those are really the only three things. So people can, OK, we're just going to go our separate ways and not talk. Yeah. Or, and, and think about think about the dominant moral ideology in the academy now of intersectionality. And what we see now is <clears throat> many in universities, <clears throat> excuse me many black students wanting their own dorms. Yeah, I mean, I've that's, seen that. That's, that's, I mean, I, or we see people want to segregate on the basis of some immutable characteristic. That's mm -hmm. just, that's un-American. I know that you're not, you, you consider yourself British, as you said, but uh, I, I would say it's even more than un-American. We see that people are, you know, even sitting at tables <clears throat> with people who hold different beliefs, not sitting at their tables or, what we need to get back to, you're an American, you're a human, I'm a human, we have pollutions, I mean, uh, oceans filling up with plastic, we're facing environmental crises, we need to stop othering each other and, you know, that part of the problem with intersectionality is you keep looking down for characteristics, oh, it's black, she's a woman, she's this, she's this, instead of going up to what physicists call superordinate identities and finding things we have in common. And so add that to the mix of why people aren't having conversations and the whole thing just falls apart. So somebody yeah. had to somebody had to write a book about how to do this. I have a deep I have a deep question for you as someone who's um you, you name know, an an atheist and who has been involved in I guess almost atheist activism at some point in your life really. I mean writing books and creating an app on it. Ask so me anything you want. <clears throat> awesome. Before you ask so, me I must say before you ask me one question I'm my my power is running low at some point, so I might have to plug in. Okay, no worries. So I have a question. So I, so I'm wondering, do you think that this rise of intersectionality and some of the divisions and people falling back into these sort of tribes, essentially, do you think that the decline of religious belief is a factor in that? I, I have a theory that it's quite a large factor, but I don't know. I'd be interested to know what your perspective is on that. Because when I look at this sort of intersectionality cult or whatnot, it is to me very similar and parallel to fundamental or quite Absolutely. radical um, religion in many ways. You know, they've they've got their they've got their whole own dictionary of words yeah. and their own sort of rituals and their in-group, out-group thing. And it's 
I, I find the parallels really, really remarkable. Right. And I've also found that people who <clears throat> are religious, regardless of their religion, I find that people who are religious, for the most part, seem to be relatively inoculated from it. So they can have some other beliefs and they can go extreme on their on the religious end, but they don't get seem to get caught up into the identity politics and intersectionality stuff in the same way. Like that does seem to be um, much more popular amongst people who do not um, have any sort of fundamental, sort of, not fundamental, traditional religious beliefs. I don't know if that's something you've observed or have any thoughts on. There is so much in what you just said. <clears throat> okay. okay. <clears throat> First of all, let's say that I disagreed with everything you just said. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I disagreed with everything you just said in terms of having a, an impossible conversation, the response I should not give is, you're wrong. The response that I should, so because it, for many reasons, one, because it's your, right? Mm. Uh, I should say, well, I'm not sure, like, I should try to unpack, let's unpack that claim or take, I don't agree with that claim. So that puts it on myself. Okay, now let's get to the meat of what you just said. So I have been writing about this for years with uh, James Lindsay. And then I've seen other people write about this. Privilege's original sin was the one of the original articles we published. Blasphemy is political correctness, mm -hmm. and we gave a talk at Portland State University. Is is intersectionality a, the new religion? We've spoken about this. Many people have spoken about this. So here's where the conversation falls. And before I give you my opinion, I'll just give you the different sides. And yeah, go for it. You, you can make a decision. So the idea is that as traditional religions declined you saw an increase in in intersectionality and those traditional i mean if if i've never plotted on a curve i don't know what survey data you'd ask people but it but my guess is that <clears throat> those curves would overlap very an xy graph those curves would be uh overlapping uh really to an eerie degree. <clears throat> and the idea is that people, it's called the substitution hypothesis. We spoke about this on Ruben, that people would substitute one belief for another belief. Mm -hmm. So people would substitute a belief in God or a belief in Christianity for a belief in intersectionality. So that's one idea. And intrinsic to that idea is that there's something in people that they need that. They need to believe something. They need to have some moral grounding Maybe the moral grounding is there, there are Nazis everywhere, et cetera. Maybe the moral grounding is I have to act a certain way to go to heaven or I have to have, you know, to be redem redemption, I have to, you know, profess my sins or whatever the, whatever the, the belief is. So that there's an architecture there in the brain in which we need to believe something and then whatever the thing that we believe is, it's just somewhat subject to the culture in which we live, you know, I don't want to make it sound like it's completely historically capricious could, because there could be evolutionary reasons for this. But the basic idea is that as one religion goes down, another one goes up. And I think the best way to think about that is, do you watch Game of Thrones? I don't know. Oh, my God, you're dead to me. I've never seen it. <clears throat> That's shocking. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anyway. I don't, have, I don't even have a TV in my house, man. Really? Well, I don't know. Game of Thrones is the one thing it's probably be worth. Anyway. <laughs> But the idea is they have old religion and the new religion, the old gods, new gods. The only reason people stop believing, the only reason you need the new gods are because people stop believing the old gods, right? So that's the substitution hypothesis. Then there's the other, on the other side, there are many more, uh, so Clay Rut Rutledge is a psychologist, and I think he, he uh, ascribes, American psychology, I think he ascribes to that. He's a, he's, a, he's a friend of mine. I don't happen to agree with that, but... Uh, Friends can have disagreements. Then on the other side, you have this idea that it has nothing to do with what's being substituted. For example, I don't know, you have no reason to know this, and I don't, very few people know this, but there's a, a tremendous split within evangelical Christianity right now, and the fault lines of that split are along the lines of intersectionality. What, to what degree do we need an intersectional lens to view the gospel? Oh really? Yeah, and it's yeah. this is a, a split that's affecting forty six million Christians. So this is not a small number of Christians. And <clears throat> is this primarily in the U.S.? This is happening. 
primarily in the U.S. Yeah, okay. but this, but as as we'll see, most things seep out of the U.S. after a few years. Yeah. Um, and so the idea there is there is no substitution. That there's something as well. I think you you you're, weren't you on Gad's podcast? Uh, he was on mine actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was on yours. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. So that uh, he would say that these ideologies have prestatized themselves. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about certain ideologies. I do not view Christianity as a parasitic ideology. Uh, I do view intersectionality as a parasitic ideology, and it prestatizes everything it comes in contact with. In other words, it's like a la it latches on to some pre-existing set of uh, canonical knowledge or belief structure or what have you, and it offers a lens through which to view this stuff. But here's the, the <clears throat> well, how are we doing so far before I go on? No, we're all good, yeah, carry on. Mm. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> here's the, the way to think about this, or one way to think about this. If the, it's, if the substitution hypothesis is correct, then people need something to believe. If the substitution hypothesis is not correct, then we don't really need anything to believe, but people are just going to believe what they're going to believe. There are, however, certain beliefs that are um, – I'm trying not to use a negative word, but the, the only negative word – that I, the only word I can actually think of is one that I, how I feel um, – metastasizes. And intersectionality really is a type of, um, it's like a type of met metastases. It's like a type of <clears throat> blackness that just a dark or a, a cancerous growth that just goes in and latches on and, and takes over, really hijacks our, our, it's like a mind virus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, the, the basic way to think about it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, that sounds about right. I mean, I think also that it's, by its very nature, it's quite, um, because it's all based around these power, perceived hierarchies and right. oppression hierarchies and victimhood statuses and what was the thing you used, progressive stack, right? It's inherently combative. You see what I mean? Like it's always, rather than looking at individuals, it's right. all, everything now becomes group-based. So someone who's, really into this stuff and is watching us having this conversation, they're seeing a black man having a conversation with a white man. Right. They're not just seeing Zuby talking to Peter. They're right. there thinking, you know, I don't know, maybe there's something you've said in this conversation that they would go, oh, you should have told him, you know, he, I don't know, he asserted his white dominance on you at this point in the conversation. And so you, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, everything is just, uh, I've seen people get obsessed with, um, I don't know, like things that I don't even notice. Do you see what I mean? So like, yeah, yeah. I'll be, I'll be watching something and listening to something and I don't even notice anything wrong or whatever. I mean, someone else will, will be like all up, upset and angry because. Yeah. And not there, only, there wasn't... not only that and you're straight, right? Are you straight? I am straight. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not only that it's two straight guys as well. Mm. Right. And so you're kind of complicit in this and I'm complicit in this and the patriarchy right here. <clears throat> yeah. The patriarchy. And we, you know, we, the, the idea of power is very important. It goes down to, it goes back to Derrida and Foucault and Leotard. But what's happened now in this new age, and Helen Pluckrose has a book about this that's coming out. It's called, she, she terms it applied postmodernism and the POMO cluster, the postmodern cluster. <clears throat> They've taken basic ideas. We see that with, you know, the works of Brazilian educator Paulo Freire, who went from, and we also see this in the Democratic Party, traditional leftist ideas of, um, remediating oppression through economics and, you know, working class and um, to, to, to the move from, from economics to race and gender. And within yeah. that, both of those have power structures operative, but the new lens is looking at the power structures in, in an almost strictly racial or gender sense uh, in a, an identity sense, sexual identity in terms of a class structure or an economic structure. Mm. And so, so I, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, so <clears throat> as an, you okay there? Yeah, I don't know. I got something in my throat. I haven't been sleeping. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, man. So, um, I mean, politically, I take it, would you, you'd consider yourself liberal politically? Would that be accurate? Would I, I strongly, yeah. strongly support Andrew Yang. He's my, okay. my guy. He's a non-crazy Democrat. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, because <laughs> I see it from afar and I've been talking about 
since, since about 2015, I've been saying that the Democrat Party is, is going off the rails. I mean, I, I said before Trump even won the Republican primary, I was telling my friends and family that I thought he had a good chance of winning and people were looking at me like I was actually insane. And lo and behold, Zuby turned out to be right. But I'd be, I'd be interested to know. So from your own perspective, I mean, what are your thoughts on just the, the current situation? I mean, I see these 20, 20 people running or whatever. And yeah. it, to me, it, I, it, it it boggles my mind. I mean, if I were American, I'd probably be a Republican voter anyway. But so in some way, I'm kind of like, OK, well, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're giving it to. But I, I find the I, I always just feel like, man, if I were a normal Democrat <laughs> or a, a normal liberal, I would be so frustrated, angry, just disheartened. You'd be disheartened. Yeah, dis disheartened. Yeah, because um, I mean. As far as I can see, I mean, yeah, Andrew Yang and Tulsi Gabbard are like the two Democrats who I can look at and be like, oh, OK, like they seem, you know, they're not they're not playing these crazy identity politics games. They're yeah. kind of fo they're focusing on the big thing. They're not trying to divide, exactly. divide men versus women and black people yeah. versus white people. They, they're, they're just talking in a language that everybody else can understand. But I'm listening to these other 17 or 18 people and I'm just like, what are you even like? Yeah, yeah, that's a very astute observation. And when you look at. You know, Clinton, what Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton, when she ran for president, it was what we're going to do for this group, what we're going to do for this group, what we're going to do for this group. I happen to have liked Obama very much. Maybe we have a difference of opinion on that. But Obama never ran on the fact that he was a black man. No, he, he didn't. ran on the fact that this is what I'm going to do. These mm -hmm. are my policies, Obamacare, health care, et cetera. Hillary Clinton's campaign was fundamentally about her being a, the first woman president. Mm -hmm. When you look at the uh, Democrats, they really have been, their mindsets have been hijacked by intersectionality. Completely. They've, they are completely, they're total identitarians. They've been taken over by radical intersectionality or even intersectionality without the word radical. But, they, but it is so pervasive in the current suite of Democratic candidates that it, it, it is nothing but disheartening. Yeah. But even beyond that, I, I happen to, so here's my little one minute plug. I think Yang can beat Trump. I think he's in savagely smart. I think he's incredibly knowledgeable. Um, I think he has sound economic policies. In fact, if you look on, on Yang's page, he has the most, even if you disagree with him, he has the most detailed uh, policies of any candidate. And he's specific, mm -hmm. this is what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get rid of the penny, this is my abortion. Like he goes through the list after thing, after thing, after thing. So it's a complete type of transparency. Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to railroad him, but um, I agree. Uh, okay, <laughs> <All right. laughs> and I, I, that's the thing is, I, I'm not. It's weird because I, I don't even follow stuff that closely. Yeah. But I think the fact that I don't maybe makes it a little easier for me to see what's going on in a weird way because I'm not close to it. I'm very emotionally detached from it. Right. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm not an American. I don't right. really have a dog in the race. I'm just kind of seeing things. I'm not like on a team here. I'm just kind of calling things how I see them. And I'm like, look, I think these 16, 17 people are right. going, going crazy because they're saying stuff and they're saying stuff, which is supposed to technically appeal to me, I guess, as a black guy, even right. You know, they're saying, oh, people of color. Da, 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 da. And I'm just like, this is alienating me. Like this is pushing me to Trump. Right. <laughs> you see what I mean? So I'm like, if, if it's doing that to me, like I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other people. There. And then of course you've got the, the economy is going strong. You know, the, the world hasn't blown up like people feared it would in 2016. Right. So yeah, I don't know. But yeah, man, just uh, I this is I feel like we could we could talk for hours, but um I'm looking at the time. I normally try to keep them cool. around around 60 minutes. So um why don't you give um a final plug for the book? Well, it's called uh, the title of the book is How to Have Impossible Conversations and it's from Decapo Press. It's out September 17th and it is the definitive guide we've written it so that anybody can use it if you want to have a conversation with someone with whom you disagree across a moral aisle across a political aisle it also teaches you how to help people question or challenge their own beliefs in a gentle civil way nobody and i mean literally nobody has ever changed their beliefs because they've been punched in the head or had a milkshake thrown at them in fact if anything that they've become more entrenched in what they believe so this is a way to i've heard it depends on the flavor of the milkshake 
Well, that you have definitely been been misled. <laughs> 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 you know, that's what Daryl Davis, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, if you know the black musician Daryl Davis. Yeah, he, yeah, 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 he's fantastic. I mean, that's the guy we should be holding up as the model, right? He goes in around and he talks to, he actually goes in Ku Klux Klan rallies and talks to Ku Klux Klan people, and he has a closet full of abnegated hoods to prove it. Does he punch people? No. Does he bring a carton of milkshakes and throw it to people at the Klan <laughs> rally? No. But he doesn't do it because it doesn't work. Right. And it doesn't it, it, these behaviors, you know, cutting up a Trump rally and putting your trucks there so that people can get through. They're not going to say, oh, you know, I before I love Trump, but unfortunately, but fortunately now I can't get through. And now I've realized the error of my ways. No. So the book will teach people in a very gentle way how to help other people question their beliefs and how to have civil conversations, because those conversations, for the most part, almost always are possible. Almost always. Agreed. Absolutely. So there we go. Um, you Peter Bogosian, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I, I appreciate you can find me on Twitter at Peter Bogosian. I appreciate it, Zuby. I very much appreciated the phone call. Um, and let me know when you're going to be over here. Maybe we'll, we'll overlap and I'll, I'll take you out to dinner. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, brother. Have an awesome day. Take care.